The seven deadly sins are a cluster of mortal sins that allegedly shape the flaws of humanity. In media, the seven deadly sins serve as a classification of characterization, in which today, I'm going to be seeing if I can pair up the seven deadly sins with seven characters that are also very heavily inspired by religious mythologies and works, the Archons of Genshin Impact. Disclaimer, this is less of a theory and more so a critical literary analysis of connected themes. What this video is, is a fun little exercise to start the year off right, where there is no right or wrong answer, just many aspects of a character that can reflect another set of themes in literature. What's also a very good point of contention about the sins is that they're not isolated from each other. Gluttony can be a form of sloth and greed, or envy can be rooted in pride. It's that blurring of definitions that make this exercise interesting, but also relatively difficult. But what I am interested in are what are your opinions for the matching. Obviously, there's no correct answer, but I want to see how you folks explain your side of the story. And I'm really, really excited to see if you have any criticisms on them. Anyway, let's begin. The deadly sins are defined in Christian literature as thoughts and dispositions that lead to sin. Contrary to popular belief, the sins themselves are not actually sins, but rather what could lead mortals to unjust actions. For example, lust can also be categorized with affection, intimacy, or attraction, but it only becomes a sin when it becomes adultery, infidelity, and other acts that would be considered immoral by societal standards. The seven deadly sins have been popular literature motifs ever since their conception, with some pieces of media completely creating characters that are defined by them. The Archons of Genshin Impact, though, don't necessarily use the seven deadly sins as their main inspiration, though the seven could have completely fooled you. The Archons are inspired by multiple mythologies based on their home nation, with their overarching inspiration being Gnosticism, the Demiurgos, and the Archons that walk through the mortal realm. By Wikipedia's definition, the Archons are sent to the imperfect world to create obstacles for the soul-seeking. But that's a story for another day. So, let's begin. Venti and the Sin of Gluttony The sin of gluttony is broadly defined as excessive consumption of food and drinks, oftentimes done so to fulfill the bodily desire instead of endeavoring for the spiritual ones. On the surface, Venti as a character would fit this criteria. He's a jovial bard that enjoys the amicable pleasantries of life, rather than dive deeper into the more difficult aspects of being a god. His Argon quest begins with him actually having to prioritize his well-being by only now coming out of slumber after several years, exemplified by his first meeting with Devalin and being opened with an apology. However, gluttony can also be exemplified with Venti's own drunken nature and how he enjoys the brilliant festivity of things. Venti's lackadaisical nature almost bleeds into a sloth-like perception of him, where he has been seen as ignorant and negligent of the people around him, even though that's not completely true, which to some extent was applicable during his absence, though. But there's not a lot of correlation to Venti being gluttony since his somewhat carefree and careless nature. However, food is oftentimes mentioned in Venti's story, as well as the fact that his physical body and appearance are not necessarily his own. But Venti himself is not exactly a danger, mirroring the potential fact that gluttony is seen as the lesser evils of the deadly sins. Nahida in the Sin of Avarice to mirror Venti's sin of gluttony is Nahida's arc and quest and characterization being an embodiment of greed. Avarice, in its basic definition, is the intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, and in this case, knowledge. Gregory the Great wrote that avarice is not just for the material, but the desire for anything immaterial for the sake of honor, fulfillment, and high position. Nahida's Arcan Quest and Sumeru's Academia exemplified the dangers of considering knowledge as the apex of human existence, as well as how far people were willing to go to bottle up knowledge and treat it like a currency. The scholars of Sumeru greeted for knowledge, which brought about their prejudice against those outside of their society. Their unjust experimentation of the people of Sumeru for the sake of their research and their unorthodox experimentation in hopes of transcending the limitations between humanity and godhood. The scholar's greed also prevented them from sharing their insights and works to those beyond the walls of Sumeru, oftentimes seeing the individuals outside of their establishment as inferior or uneducated when it's clearly not true. But as the Archon quest continues, I believe that Skyrimush himself also became an embodiment of the sin of greed. His desperation for power as a final grasp of his own striving for perfection and ambition is best felt when he reached out for the gnosis that never belonged to him. 
As for Nahida's characterization as the goddess of wisdom and the sin of greed, I don't think that the indicators are as overt, but they are present in the way her story overall is meant to be her constant searching for knowledge. Dragon Quest wasn't her ending as much as it was her beginning of her long journey. Nahida is constantly in the search for knowledge due to her quote-unquote new status as an Archon. Her lack of memory is creating a story where she must now scour even the smallest bits of divine information as the god of wisdom. Actually, Nahida herself counters the sin of greed by happily giving knowledge to those that deserve it and those that search for it. She believes that knowledge and wisdom should be shared amongst all people without pride or prejudice. Zhongli and Envy In my opinion, Zhongli and Envy are the weakest connection between all of the Archons considering that Envy is defined as a strong desire to covet for what is not yours. It's a desire to have what you can't. If there is one aspect that Zhongli's story continues to perpetuate though, it's the theme of transitioning power over to humanity and Zhongli himself retiring into a life of a quote-unquote regular mortal. In all honesty though, I feel like there's a deeper connection to be made here of Zhongli wanting to further understand his predicament as the oldest Archon and an Archon with the contract to Celestia as well as living the normal retirement life that he wanted for himself. In reality, there's no true way for him to actually break his contract with Celestia, not even with the Cerites' help. This is evidenced by the fact that while Liyue is being ran by the Qi Sing, for all intents and purposes, Zhongli is still the Archon of Liyue even without his Gnosis. And even now, Zhongli is currently living with his contract with Celestia through his erosion. Other characters also hint that there is deeper lore and mystery pertaining in Zhongli's history that have yet to be settled, such as the old gods whose spirits plague the lands of Liyue, and even the Hydro Dragon himself having his own obligations against Zhongli. But other than that, Zhongli's story is filled with contentment and genuine peace and tranquility. It's too hard to see him covet for something more than that. A and the Sin of Sloth The Sin of Sloth is one of the more broadly defined sins in Christian mythology, with sloth being akin to different facets. Sloth isn't just laziness, but rather the consequences of inactivity which A and her prospect of eternity embody very well. A's Arkan Quest explores the dangers of focusing on eternity as a form of stagnation and fear of unwarranted innovation and advancement bringing forth destruction. And while those are very valid fears, her enforcement of eternity also breathes new problems in Inazuma such as the Sakoku Decree and the Vision Hunt Decree. A's plane of Euthymia could also be seen as her own way of stagnation, a method to prevent her own erosion. But in turn, she relegated all of her responsibilities to the Shogun. However, to say that A is at fault isn't necessarily fair to her character, considering that her sloth could be accounted for years of learned helplessness in the face of the greater foundational principles of the world, whether it be the actual principles or simply the test of time and death. Sloth, as a sin, can be benign, but it can intentionally birth ignorance negligence, and apathy, which is why it's also very symbolic that A's own character story and Arkan Quest is meant to be her growing out of that state of stillness that she invoked upon herself, gaining a better understanding of the Inazuma that she and her sister envisioned through accepting that hardship, pain, and suffering simply go hand in hand with growth, innovation, and life. Saritza and Wrath the simplest form of wrath is the untamed and uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, and hatred. But its true form is the unbridled tribulation one feels when they seek out vengeance, revenge, or retribution. Wrath in and of itself is different from being mad, but it's the perpetual state of blinding lust for violence or harm that differentiates it from the emotion. And out of all the Archons we know now, the Saritza best exemplify the Saritza best exemplifies Rat's deeper connotations with revenge. Her plots against the heavenly principles in the Fatui's establishment came from years of emotion against what happened to Conria. What war she wishes to wage come the final era of Tuvat's days, or whatever final retribution the Fatui are destined to carry out, stems from millennia of the Saritza's rage against the heavenly principles. And though somewhat justified that the Cerise's goals are pure and just, her motivation is set on defying the callous foundational principles of the world and to rid the land of the short-sighted ignorant gods and the abyss. Almost all of the Harbinger lore and propaganda also have these underlying themes of revenge and retribution against someone that wronged them. Scaramouche and the betrayals, Notoria with academia, Pantalone with the gods who didn't give him anything, and so on and so forth. Totality of her dimensions that she was once a gentler soul that had to harden her heart. Fossilor and Pride There are many who say that pride is the deadliest of the sins. 
because in a way, it is the inability to believe that there is anyone worthy of judging you or your actions, just erasing the possibility of humility. There are two aspects of pride that are best shown through Farina and Fossilor. One is the outward, more theatrical interpretation of pride. The haughty, arrogant, and extravagant exterior of Farina that she showed to the people as a mask for her plight. Her image of being the perfect archon for the people relied on her having the facade of a prideful, everything was going to be fine kind of archon. This facade that she set out for herself was the perfect textbook definition of the word pride, which contrasts beautifully with the truth of Farina being a human who believed that a single mistake could ruin everything she is worked hard for. Farina is humble enough to know that her position is very important and that she must take it with utmost responsibility. The second aspect of pride was, in its own way, Fossilor's plan. I believe that while Fossilor's plan was very necessary for the salvation of the people of Fontaine, it was because she believed that not only was his secrecy crucial, but also because both Farina and Fossilor believed that no one else could possibly help them fulfill this plan. Except maybe Nervolet, who was a secondary actor in all honesty at the matters at hand. And even then, he didn't know the true extent of the situation. Fossilor in the Arcan Quest even takes pride that she was able to outsmart the prophecy set for her, despite the losing hand dealt to her by the previous Archon and the Heavenly Principles. But the beauty of pride reflected in this case is that pride isn't a deadly sin, but rather an act of necessity. Pride is a very isolating deadly sin, which clouds the judgment. But it wasn't to the fault of Farina or Fossilor that matters had to be taken to a very large extreme. At the very least, I hope that Farina is proud that she was able to save the people of Fontaine. However, this all leaves Natlin with lust. Lust as a sin is a consumption of voluptuous emotion, intense desire for something, or the want for the overabundance for the sake of carnal desire. Lust, gluttony, and greed actually all play in the same avenues of why they're sins, but lust is more commonly seen with anything sexual. Now, that's not completely wrong, but it's a deeper understanding of why that's the case that's important. After all, in most religious texts that the seven deadly sins are derived from, lust is immoral because it goes against a preordained natural law, or is also a boundless appetite that controls the person's actions rather than intellect, morality, or emotions. Blinded by lust is a very good example of this. But lust doesn't have to correlate with libido or desire. It can also correlate to something like power or knowledge. What I want to consider for Natlin is if the Archon is the epitome of lust, it's them wanting an overabundance of something that goes against a natural order. Maybe the story continues where Fontaine left off, about actively defying the heavenly principles, and escalates it where the whole Archon quest is meant to be a culmination of something that goes against the preordained laws of Devot. Something like a resurrection, maybe. Who knows, really? Now, that's it for me today. Of course, this list isn't final, and I doubt that it ever will be. Again, this is all just an exercise, and I'm interested to see what you guys have for me. Leave it down in the comments below, and my name is Aster, and thank you for chilling with me. Bye-bye!